Okay, welcome to the all in recitation. Uh, up until now, the recitations have shown projects. Today is different because the recitation became the project. Uh, a few years ago, we did a recitation on diversity, equity, inclusion, and an amazing group that pulled that together didn't want to stop. That became this group. And along the way, they also uh, generalized the name to Fab All In, which they'll explain. So, Joel. Or, Joel, you want to? No, Sherry, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> well, I'd like to say welcome, bienvenido, bienvenue, uh, from uh, all of us here. Um, would you all like to say welcome as well from the team? In all languages at once? Yes, in all languages at once. How about One, two, that? One, two, three. Welcome. Welcome. Yes. Welcome. 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 <laughs> so this is uh, this is the Fab All In team. Um, this is a, as Neil said, this started from uh, um, uh, an interest in and an effort around diversity, equity, and inclusion. We realize that this network is extraordinarily diverse, and um, but we also understand that we're uh, not always inclusive, and it may not be because we intend to be non-inclusive, but if we are inclusive, we are more successful in every way that you can think of. And so, um, and so really, this was about, uh, we decided what we really wanted to do and needed to do was to look into the network and see what were the practices that others were doing in the network that were beautiful and inclusive and helped them succeed because many of many labs suffer from the same things you know suffer from the same challenges and many of those challenges have been solved by others and solved in beautiful and different ways and so really what this is about is tapping into the mind share of the network to find those beautiful success stories and share those practices across the network and so so uh, it's a beautiful course. We love it. We, did, we piloted it last year, and this team did an incredible job of pulling together really interesting ideas and best practices. And we learned so much from all of you from the community um, that we now want to we want to continue this process uh, to continue to encourage the development of uh, wonderful, beautiful practices around inclusion and equity, and uh, and also to share those practices across the network. And so to talk a little bit about, a little bit more about this, uh, I'd like to turn it over to Megan, Megan Smith. Hi, everybody. Um, next slide up, we have, see Jill. Um, a little bit just quickly about what we're gonna do. And this is a, what we sometimes call rapid share. You know, uh, one slide, I think uh, one or two minutes, and each of the people from the network are going to give a sampler, you know, just a taste of what uh, you can, or what already exists in the world. A lot of times when we're working on diversity, equity, inclusion topics, people kind of say to the people in the room with them, what should we do about this? And they they kind of reinvent ideas, and that's an okay practice, but if you actually, instead of looking down, look up and say, I wonder who has already fixed this in some form, and what does that form take? You can actually move a lot faster. One thing I'll share just in, in the chat is that MIT, like every institution in the world, is working on this, and they reframed the DEI conversation recently to belonging. What does it feel to be like here? Achievement? Is everybody able to be a leader, be technical? Is everybody able to do anything or not? Do we have an imbalance? And three, composition. What's our makeup relative to the population around us? Are we missing some people? And then the infrastructures. So you can see we'll get into these different pieces shortly. What I want to do now, um, before we get into a, a couple of things, I want to go to the next slide, just to share that we're putting together a zine that goes deeper with many of the different colleagues. And again, anyone welcome, everyone welcome, every topic welcome. So we could work on anything in fab labs, that's our goal. Um, and so how are we making that true? That social, environmental, health, whatever topic of the world somebody wants to work on, that they feel like this is a place where they work on that. They wanna write poems, whatever it is they wanna do. They feel that welcome, they belong. 
and that uh, we're working against uh, lots of bias to, to, to reduce biases. So you'll see some of our colleagues who are who became our curriculum, um, you know, co-inventors on this. So I think the next step we want to, um, Benno, so, we want to do an exercise, uh, right? In, in a minute, I'm going to stop sharing the screen and yep. so that Benno can do his exercise. But just as an overview, um, we're going to have a set of sessions that Rico is going to introduce on uh, systemic all-in impact. Nuri is going to introduce a set of sessions on the natural and cultural context. Sherry is going to introduce a set of sessions on economic vitality. Uh, and Benno is going to do introduce a set of sessions on changing systems together, all of which are in the spirit of what Megan has said, which is that the ideas are out there if we look up and look around. And each presentation will just be two minutes. So it's a teaser. But I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Hold on one sec. Yeah. I got one more thing. Go. So, and the solution for Lisa, we'll talk about in a sec, but go too forward. Okay. So I want to share this just for framing. Uh, this is just, you know, you can find wonderful things on the internet. Here's some data that I found that shows who gets to speak in movies. These are 2000 super popular films. And I share it because the blue is male lines and the pink is, or the, the red is women's line, female lines. And just the society we're in has all kinds of biases. This graphic is a really good way to show us you know, imbalance around us. We want to hear from our men and our women uh, in a balanced way. So just sharing this, you can see at the bottom, it's children's um, TV. Also, we're teaching, none of us made this world, we grow into it. And when we're children, we teach children that the men speak more, or boys, the women speak less, or girls. Even films like, these, this happens to be Disney, Milan and Frozen are more than 50%. Milan is 70% boys' lines. And also, as we get older, men get more lines in TV. So you want to be what you see. So we just did is we're going to even introduce our program, not with us as MCs, but each of us sharing voice so you can be what you see, that everyone around the world can be the leader in the MC. Joel, I don't think we have a second slide here, do we? Um, to the no. next. One. Oh, just historically, this was just sharing that a lot of times technology is considered the realm of a more male realm especially computer science and coding. We see that in so many of our school programs, but I just want to share on the left that a woman at the same time as Darwin worked in the, in the mid 1800s invented algorithms, Lord Byron's poet math daughter. And that um, today they're talking about some of the work at Bletchley Park where they broke the codes during World War II to be able to um, hear uh, Nazis uh, encryption things. And, and they are credited on the bottom there, the Duchess of Cambridge's great aunt and grandmother that two thirds of the women at Bletchley Park who broke the codes were two thirds of the people were women, technical women. Uh, and on the right here, Ida B. Wells at the top, Jane Addams in the second industrial age, they were working to do justice with data and technology. Uh, Ida just won the Pulitzer Prize here in the US two years ago for really what was Black Lives Matter data science work in the late 1800s. And she also uh, worked with Frederick Douglass, famous other civil rights leader here to um, try to get an African-American exhibition in the Chicago World's Fair. We have a colleague in All In who's in the Chicago buildings from uh, that time, 1892. They were not allowed. So everyone can present except you. And so the sculptors and inventors and the fab members of that day were not allowed. If you wanna read that pamphlet, it's called The Reason Why. Or Jane Addams, who was using technology for the community, a wise, city, not a just smart city, but a smart wise city for the people involved. So just kind of lift these histories because a lot of times people's history get evaporated. Um, and yet we can stand on the shoulders of these heroes and know that everyone was always all in, even if they weren't recorded in history. So thanks everybody for being here. It's sort of a, a stone soup production from the fable in France where we work together to see what already exists and catalyze ourselves to be able to make that true as soon as possible in our own labs um, in a collaborative, fun way. So and by the way, um, Jane Addams became, is the founder of the field that we now call social work. Yeah. So why wouldn't social work be deeply considered a computer science field? And yet they're in two different buildings a lot of times, although I'll tell you that the USC Viterbi School is now working together with their social work. So the opportunity is here for all topics especially the justice and equality topics, environmental topics and others. I think that's the last slide we have on this run, right? Do it is. Like oh. one more? I don't have the slide. Oh, on, on yeah, to you, 
Okay. Thank you. And thank you, Joel, Megan, Cherry. Uh, we are super happy to share with you uh, this game. We call the uh, Symbio game. Um, please come to the link that I paste in the chat and you will find an interface, this interface. So uh, we have created this uh, to measure the level of integration and synchronization of the group. Um, and this tool consists in create an image that could be recognizable for everybody at the end of one minute. Um, to create something, you, you can choose the color at the bottom and then mark in the canvas. Please try to do it. And you will see the change in real time here. I hope you can uh, come in that. Yes, we can see <laughs> all your changes. Thank you so much. We are testing that it is working. And here's the goal. We have to build together in one minute an image that will be recognizable for everybody at the end. The only condition is you cannot talk or chat previously or agree for other medium uh, about what to do. All the communication has to be done through this interface. Are you ready? Okay, let's do it. One, two, three, let's start. So the clock is ticking, you have one minute. Yes, exactly. Forty seconds. Okay, okay. Twenty seconds. We have to see. Then. Five, four, three, two, one, and stop. <laughs> what do we uh -huh. have here? <laughs> what do you think? Any volunteer? Please feel free to open your microphone and share with us your impressions and your experience. I think this group is oriented towards abstract art. <laughs> More abstract, more chaotic, yes. Maybe a stairway up on the left. Yeah. <laughs> maybe, maybe an elephant in the middle. <laughs> what could we say about our level of synchronization through this image? Someone said volcano, by the way. Yeah, well, in my experience, in more than five years doing this challenge, more than 95% failed to generate a recognizable image in the, in the first iteration. The last year, it was amazing. And <laughs> really, we have to recognize. Uh, if you see the video of the, uh, the previous year of this version, it was really crazy and outside of any statistic. But this is common. This is natural. We, this is what usually happens when we want to make something together. Yeah. Um, for many different reasons, no? for example, yeah, we are here like a more a mechanical uh, or random, random, randomly action. No, I am marking because well, I want to test, I want to approach to others, etc. No, and um, also maybe because I have um, the best uh, predisposi predisposition <laughs> to collaborate, the best the best attitude to collaborate, but I am trying. Uh, impose an image, not to maybe I say, well, I want to make a car, I want to make a flower or a tree, and I have this idea and I want to do it, but I feel that nobody uh, uh, wants to do that. No? And so at the end, I felt frustrated thinking that the collaboration does not work because nobody do what I want to do. No? So what kind of attitude do you think uh, could help us or could uh, bring us more possibilities to uh, create a collaborative image. What kind of, I don't know, no, uh, actions, uh, if we want to recreate that, do you think will work better? Any idea? Super Hank. Oh, sorry. 
watching what people other people are doing and trying to follow their lead somehow like getting a intuitive sense of like which directions a few people are going maybe that is a key point thank you super megan exactly no uh, take a take a pose no not just mark just see no connect empathy of course no and also blank mind no don't come with any idea just to connect with others and just create these relations and identifying opportunities in others' contributions. Any other, any other idea, comment, please? And we are close to time. Yes. Okay, well, just a, uh, as final reflection, uh, this game, it's about how to integrate rather than impose. Thank you, thank you, Joel, thank you, friends. Thank you. Okay, so yeah. I think the, the next point is just uh, that, uh, again, this idea, you know, Neil, you gave us this idea um, early on of uh, go, ready, set, or yeah. set, go, ready, if the, you know, sort of getting together first. And so this is an example, a global example. Some people may be aware of the sustainable development goals. Um, set by the UN in 2015, which are like the Millennium Development Goals. They are there on the left. You can see them. Um, and I would share that one of the things we did was we just asked using social media and email and all kinds of different outreach, who is not what we should do, we do, what do you think, but who's already fixing these goals? What are you doing in the world? What are you already doing? And, and maybe there's a regional solution fully baked, maybe there's a prototype, maybe there's something. And then what we do is uh, we, the first time we get 800 emails into the UN in three weeks from 131 countries that we did it for five years. Um, and then in the fifth year, 1400 submissions from 141 countries in like two, three to four weeks. And then 400 of the people wanted to be on the review committee. And so a thousand solutions, you know, that you would have never known about just because someone bothered to fill out a simple form on the internet. So this are examples on the left is women texters to Vera, you know, teaching amazing uh, coding boot camps across much of Africa, women joining uh, into the tech sector there and into the tech sector globally. So just being aware. And then the main thing about the events that we did was not only did we hear from the innovator, but you see the round tables, that's an islands of innovation uh, working in Hawaii. Different innovators give a quick pitch like our like we're going to hear, you know, maybe a little longer. We went four minutes. What are they working on? What's working? Why, et cetera. And then we sit down and we do two thirds yes and, one third yes but. Um, two thirds yes and means how can I help you? What kind of partnerships, ideas, what kind of funding, business model? What can I think of? Are there youth who could help this person move faster um, or this team? And then everyone needs a little critique. So one third, yes, but a little bit of critique, like I'm not sure this works. Um, so really interesting way of community organizing innovation. And that's really how we as a, a leadership team of everybody all in created this curriculum is really looking for who was already in a, almost like a guild, the old guilds, apprentice journey mastery, who already was already at mastery, you know, an example, people are trying to get more gender balance in their fab lab. Well, ask Nuria. People are trying to figure out a business model. You know, let's ask uh, uh, Rico what he's doing. People are trying to start like we just did with this thing. Start with the community first and then move into making. Ask Benno. You know, people are doing amazing things with rural. Well, let's ask Pradna. So, you know, just we can have these elite capable teammates out there. And that's what this UN Solution Summit was about. Last thing I'll just mention is this DQ Institute crowdsourced all the kinds of digital skills you could have. And look at that stunning thing. I'll put the link to it that we could be teaching, not just coding and not just about gaming. Some kids love gaming, uh, but people like other things, you know, all the things we could do. So just remembering on the left at the top, in effort, there's joy. And everyone can have joy in their effort. And how do we frame Fab Lab in that way? And how do we work with these master folks? So I think that's the only slide here. Is that correct? Yep. So the solution. So I, 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 and I have the unhappy job of monitoring time. And so um, forgive me for uh, moving us along. Uh, but thank you. Uh, the UN Sustainable Goals do provide uh, a high level vision that motivates us all. Um, and in the spirit of what Megan has shared, Rico, take us into the first section. 
Okay, great. Um, so for the first section, uh, we're dealing with the systemic all-in impact. Um, as, as Fab Lab members, managers, and instructors, we know how to make things, uh, building machines, programming, digitally fabricating our skills we have put into practice every single day. But as Fab Labs, however, we tend to self-isolate rather than extend ourselves to those who making is not an instinct or, or those that are marginalized from the fab ecosystem because the, of economic challenges, gender, or simple uh, lack of awareness of what we do. So reaching out, what we do and has, uh, yeah, reaching out and sharing what we do has the potential to do more than uh, self-gratify uh, or self-benefit uh, by offering access to those who have been intentionally or unintentionally excluded uh, we, we can uh, do more uh, for, for our community, for the world. Uh, we have three uh, speakers coming up here who have done those things, uh, have, have made an effort to reach out and address uh, exclusionary uh, situations uh, and, and find a solution for them. Uh, we start off with uh, Nuria. Please take it away. And by the way, that's the sound that you'll hear at two minutes. Thank you so much for the introduction. Um, yes, I will try to explain we are, why we in FabLab Leon are focused in education and girls covering the SDG number four and five. The reality is that more girls are in school today than ever before, but they do not have always the same opportunities as boys to complete and benefit from an education of their choice. Girls and women are particularly underrepresented in STEM education and consequently in STEM careers. This gender disparity is alarming, alarming, especially as STEM careers are often referred to as the jobs of the future, driving innovation, social well-being, inclusive growth and sustainable development. For this reason, UNESCO is dedicating part of uh, its effort to promote empowerment of girls and women through education. Taking this lead, these are our strategies to bring technology closer to girls and encourage their participation in uh, STEAM fields. We uh, think that starting girls uh, with girls from seven years old in STEAM activities that allows uh, them to acquire skills and confidence from an early age is good. We think that inviting the families of the girls to participate in the activities of Fabla Leon is good because this creates a welcoming and communi community environment that facilitates learning and collaboration. We think also that offering inspiring and motivating talks uh, that show the potential, uh, the potential of technology and STEAM careers and highlight the importance of inclusivity, uh, inclusion and diversity on these uh, areas is also uh, good. And of course, we encourage uh, girls of different uh, age to collaborate with different girls and teach to each other. For all of these reasons, we believe that start with girls in an early uh, age is good, is good for this inclusion. Thank you so much. Boy, that was a loud timer. Um, thank you so much. Next. Right, so uh, next, I believe it's Pradya with uh, Rural Sustainability. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I hope I am audible. Okay, great. Uh, so I'm uh, Pradnya from India. It's a uh, coastal side of uh, Maharashtra, uh, the Ratnagiri place called near the Bombay. So in rural sustainability, I'm just trying to contribute little from my side. I have previous work experience more than seven years in Vigyan Ashram, which is famous for the rural development and rural technology. So uh, nowadays, the migration is a big issue in rural India uh, because for the employment, education, these people are trying to migrate in the city area. So uh, as per the SDG goal, I'm trying to uh, like use one, two, three, four, five, like education for all employment, no poverty, no hunger. So in that way, I'm doing few things. So I just want to showcase here. So uh, uh, what I'm exactly doing, so it's like, um, ensuring the use of advanced technology and employment in rural area. Because in rural area, we have uh, so much traditional methods are available to process the foods, process the farming, uh, or any purpose. 
so uh, for example this betel nut is uh, people are like uh, doing by manually like by hand so i have recently made this kind of machine uh, i think joel can you please play that video the student so these students are coming to our lab and uh, this is the IBT program, Introduction to Basic Technology. It's uh, conducted by the Vigyan Ashram and I'm, I'm associated it, with it uh, for mentoring purpose. So these students like identify the problems, like it's very time consuming process. So we like use the traditional method to uh, not in digital, but it's in fabrication way. Uh, second is uh, mango pulp maker. Uh, mango pulp maker. So there is a mango um, roller available in India. I think maybe some of you will know about this uh, desert things. So it taking a time consuming and humans need to stir it continuously. So these students from the IBT schools, they have made the pulp maker. We actually put the sensor over it. So after certain temperature reach, so it stopped the heating the uh, that uh, container and it continuously stirring at the same temperature. So these things are doing as a traditional to digital way. Then second is like uh, reducing the, okay no okay so that's also like we are trying to reach out the people educated them and just trying to make some projects with them thank you so much Joel. thank you everyone thank you so much okay and our final speaker for the section is dua who's uh reaching out to yeah non-makers <laughs> all right uh hi everyone good evening uh, i'm Dua from Pabla Bahrain. Um, basically, uh, just to explain the solution, I think I have to sort of explain the problem. Uh, we were having a bit of an issue uh, with reaching mostly casual participants, and I feel like that might be an issue with a lot of fab labs around the world, where people that are non-makers are super intimidated to come into the fab lab and actually like learn what the fab lab is about. They just feel like it's not for them. So um, we've done a bunch of like uh, surveys, asking people, trying to figure out like what's going on. Why is the fab lab so scary? Why are you so scared to get there? So um, one thing that was reported is that the events we did seemed so intimidating. So we do an event that was like, learn how to program a robotic arm in different programming languages and just kind of like scared people. So here the solution or like what we're working towards is creating um, clubs geared towards like non-makers to kind of make the fab lab a place for everyone, not intimidating. So the key here is kind of going for things that are quick. So like one to two hours, uh, low effort. So someone coming in wouldn't have to put in a ton of effort and low commitment, kind of like trying to help out people that are just scared about the idea of fabrication. So uh, one of the things we're planning to pilot or launch or a design club where people can come in and kind of like design together in like a non-intimidating setting using any design software. Uh, a tech document documentaries club where people can come in, watch a documentary together and like discuss it afterwards. Very low effort, very low commitment. And then uh, scan the world, which is we're hoping to kind of like scan, 3D scan different landmarks. So what you see like the pictures on the right are parts of kind of like our uh, first events kind of like trying to launch this, which was kind of like a casual gathering uh, and Ramadan, where people came together, were eating food, playing games together that were in a way kind of like related to technology, but not so scary. And we got some really good feedback there. So hopefully we're moving into launching clubs very soon. Super. And that's time. Uh, and I might say that Dua was in the sessions that we did last fall and at the end proposed this, and now she's moving forward with her proposal. Exactly. Super. Uh, the next section, Nuria, take us away. Hello, everyone. Again, I am very happy to introduce the natural and cultural context. We are, uh, we are giving uh, three nice uh, explanations uh, from the Amazons and uh, in the part of Beno, that is a former student of Fab, Fab Academy and also the founder of Fab, uh, Fab Lab Peru. And then we will go to, to the Materium, that is a, a digital library of materials. And then we will also listen to Adrian Torres from Fab Lab Leon, that he has completed the manifesto about the Fab Lab culture, why it's uh, import, so important to make this culture in all the, of uh, the organization, but also in, in a fab lab. 
and he's a former student for the Fabolin. So I want to introduce Beno Juarez with the Amazon Gardens. Beno, please. Thank you, Nuria. I have prepared this video for you. I hope you will enjoy it, please. Thank you. The Paiche is the largest fish in the Amazon rainforest, adapted to navigate its rivers of turbid waters, dealing with organic sediments that hinder visibility and decrease oxygen in the water. That is why these fabulous fish have a bladder that functions as a kind of primitive lung, allowing it to compensate for its oxygen deficiency by surfacing to take in groups of air. Our drinks can also be like a journey in turbid waters, where we are uncertain about when exactly we will achieve what we are looking for and where the prolonged nature of the journey can make us lose motivation, breath and oxygen. The Floating Fab Lab Amazon is a long-term dream, conceived from the long of the world and sustained it thanks to the oxygen of many of you. Today, it gains a new momentum through an alliance with the creator of PIAS, platform for social action that bring government services to the most remote communities in the Amazon, where there are no medical posts, banks, etc. Its creator is a mariner, Jorge Moscoso, and his vision captivated me from the first moment. He told me, the first level of national security is education and inclusion. Wow. Only then we can win followers away from drug trafficking, illegal logging, etc. Today, Jorge opens up the PS project to adapt it to the requirements of the Floating Fab, which will contain a Fab Lab, a Bio Lab, a Nutrition and Astronomy Lab, an Eco Lab, and accommodation for 20 crew members. The Paiche Master challenged us to don't remain still, to show uncertitude over inertia and to anticipate extra oxygen so we don't give up on the journey. Thank you so much. Super. Thank you so much, Beno. And we are pleased the to... The Paiche is the largest fish right. in the <laughs> Amazon. We, I want to welcome also to introduce Pilar Volumburu from Materium. Pilar. Hi, Nuria. Um, thank you for inviting me. Uh, my name is Pilar and I work as a designer and material researcher at Materium. Uh, Materium is a platform that supports organizations and communities to develop their own sustainable materials with local and abundant biomass. So similar to, to fabrication that enables local manufacturing, we also need local materials that align with sustainable goals. Uh, a great example of this is a collaboration we did with Fab Lab Austral, uh, the most southern Fab Lab uh, on an island in the south of Chile that you can only access by air of sea or sea. The same condition makes it very difficult to source products and materials from the continents. So we found that there were tons of waste from spider crab fishing that is one of the main commercial activities of, in, of the island. So from the shells of the crabs, you can extract chitin. That is an incredible natural molecule that you can use to make biomaterials with great properties that are not toxic and that they can biodegrade eventually to the environment. So you can see in the photo some examples of the process and how with a mix of gel fabrication and do-it-yourself fermentation process, we explore for a year the potential materials that can be made locally. And this is still an ongoing project, but has helped to engage the local community uh, with the Fab Lab and to open options to, for them to create their own materials. And also based on that research, we are also conducting a similar project now on the Galapagos Islands. So they present a similar challenge because they are also an island and also this type of developments as like biodegradable materials uh, also help to address the huge problem they have now around plastic pollution and their natural environments. Thank you. Super. Thank you so much. And, and last but not least, Adrián from Fabla Leon. Hello, thank you so much, Nuria. Uh, my name is Adrián Torres. I'm from, from Fab Lab León. Uh, during the Fab Aulín, we had to think a solution palusa, and in my case, it was a decalogue of manifesto about the Fab Lab culture and who are the different people that surround the Fab Lab and the connections between them. But before, I had to analyze the roses, the thorns, and the boots around the around me. It was the first session for me? The roses had been my discovery years ago of the Fal Lab Leon, the people, the new friends, and the new family. The COVID arrived and the tones uh, was, was the tones and it had to be renewed. And in Fal Lab Leon, we began to train children and the young people. Then in the next session, it was about asking five questions. What, why, who, when, and where, and answering with a how. 
And we all know that it's difficult to answer the question in synthesis. For me, everything had an answer, the people. So seeing my evolution, apprentice, volunteer, student, instructor, everything was related. That's what my idea for the Falla culture, the Falla culture manifesto was born. And in the schematic, you can see the result of the analysis. Everything is connected. This analysis can be used to find the community of any fat lab. And I want to summarize with a phrase from Nuria, it's difficult to work alone. Thank you so much. <laughs> Super, and I see um, Vanessa has a hand up. Did you want to make a comment? Vanessa? Did you want to make a comment with your hand up? You're muted. No. Okay. Uh, well, uh, next up yeah. is Sherry. Take us into economic vitality. So, yes. So, this is um, um, something that is very important to the network is uh, the economic vitality and sustainability of our labs and the our ability to support uh, innovations and new ideas across the network. And so, these our next wonderful speakers are are going to tell us different stories about their innovations and their uh, their vitality and how they maintain and sustain that. So I think we'd love to start with you, Rico, uh, around if economic independence. Uh, Rico uh, is from Kamakura, Japan, and he's gonna he's one of the leaders of this uh, of this work as well. Rico. Okay, thanks, Sherry. Um, so uh, in in my time as a member of the Fab Lab community. A topic of discussion that arises often is uh, Fab Lab economic sustainability. It, it, it's a problem that uh, everyone complains about. Uh, as a former company analyst and uh, investor, I, I mulled over this question and uh, believed that I might have come up with something of a solution. Um, so the fact is, uh, within the global economic engine, uh, small and medium enterprises accounts for 90% of global businesses, 50% of employment, and very importantly, 40% of uh, the global uh, gross domestic product of many uh, nations. Um, so I noticed that all over Japan, there are lots and lots of mom and pop businesses, uh, places like ramen shops, as an example, that have been in business for decades. Uh, so I, I thought that why not look to these small businesses as models for running an independent, uh, sustainable fab lab um, uh, since they've been so successful. I'm sure in your city, in wherever you're located, there are small businesses that have been around for uh, many, many years, and perhaps they could be the ones to advise you on how to uh, keep going uh, for, for years and years with your fab lab. So as, as just a quick run of some of the techniques that I think are, are uh, I, I've noticed in, in looking at these companies or, or these businesses, is a brutal uh, recurring income and uh, expense management. Every fab lab has to deal with monthly rent, uh, labor costs, utility costs, but very few have plans for how to generate revenue on a regular basis. So uh, a small business owner uh, has this as a priority because you know the, the failure of their business means the failure of their family to survive. Uh, so they take it very seriously. The second idea here is that all equipment in the lab should pay rent. And by this, I mean, don't buy any machine that will not generate revenue. Don't, don't have it as a placeholder or decoration within your lab, but it should be something that could be a part of a class or a service that you We're offer and, and pays itself up. Uh, maybe two quick thing is, you know, it's less painful to scale up than down. Uh, so spiral development, the, the growth of your business. And lastly, be valuable to your regular regulars and your local community. These are the people that will keep make sure that you stay alive for years and years and years. Thank you. Thank you, Rico. This is excellent advice. Um, now we're going to go to uh, to Indonesia to Satyawan, um, who is working with the Yogya Open Innovation for Community Enhancement. So uh, we'd love to hear from you, uh, Satyawan. Okay, uh, thank you, Sherry. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Stiawan from FabLab Jogja, Indonesia. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to share our project, namely Joyce. 
uh, Jogja Open Innovation for Community Enhancement. Uh, we develop uh, we developed a five lab in district area with uh, high property rates, and the majority of the population here are farmer. Uh, the main problem here is that the traditional farmer, especially for women farmer group, are uh, still lagging behind the technology. And also we have a poor farmer generation because the young people are not interested in the farming because their assumption that the farming is rough work. So we propose this project to introduce this, uh, the, to introduce the digital fabrication from the community around the fab lab and how they can make innovation to solve their problem in agricultural sector and thereby increase uh, their income. This uh, project involves all stakeholders from the university, industry, government, and community. Uh, there are several activities starting with uh, an agreement and commitment with, uh, with all the stakeholders to support the open innovation program in society. And then uh, we help and facilitate, uh, facilitate the community to identify what their problems are, not just their desire, but uh, the root of their problem in the agriculture sector. And we invite all stakeholders to jointly uh, to find the solution for farmer problem and make it an, a sketch solution. Uh, from the result of the sketch solution, we uh, make prototype together with the farmer. Of course, uh, there are also short costs using uh, FabLab equipment. Uh, for the ex example, how to make sprinkle system for education with IoT system. And our hope is that uh, by introducing the digital fabrication technology to the farmer, supported by in the government industry, they can be the way, creative to build innovation for better life. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was uh, that was really interesting to to understand how you can do this at a community scale and do it well, and uh, we really appreciate that. Um, next, we have. Um, a different kind of innovation. This is targeted at uh, the textile and uh, fashion industry in a way. Uh, this is the Fabric Academy program, which is led by uh, Cecilia Rasp Raspanti and Anastasia Pistufidu. And uh, they, I don't believe they're here today, but on their behalf, I believe Nuri is going to um, present something about this wonderful innovation. Yes, and uh, Anastasia is with, with her baby, so she asked me just to, to say some, some words. So yeah, this, this amazing idea, uh, and also with our beloved Fiore, uh, started five years ago, and, uh, and, and they started as we started with the Favolin. So they have prepared a very nice video that we can uh, see in the next slide, please. Fabric Academy is the transdisciplinary course at the intersection of textiles, digital fabrication and biology. imagine a dream program, how would it be? We are talking about understanding our environment, our context, and creating together. Join Fabricademy! <laughs> and that's uh, all. Thank you so much. I love it. Oh, my goodness. Um, 
Okay, so uh, the 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 sort of last presentation in this uh, economic vitality grouping is uh, by Vanessa Cacho, Cacho, sorry, Vanessa, and um, we mm -hmm. met in Peru many many years ago for Fab Seven, uh, Fab Seven. That's a long time ago, uh, and she has uh, she is just an amazing force, and we'd love to hear from you about your carpentry ecosystem. Thank you. Hello, everybody. My name is Vanessa Caicho, and I am a carpenter from, from many, many years. And in 2012, I began the experiment of merging traditional carpentry with digital fabrication in Peru. I couldn't put aside the important knowledge of our master carpenters, like my grandfather. And I wanted to document all those experiences and his expertise in digital version, like the Fab Academy, um, iFurniture Startup, and um, the Fab Lab iFurniture in the Carpentry Workshop in a school in Lima, Peru. And I am promoting this hybrid called digital carpentry. So my solution, Palusa, is to build a carpentry ecosystem. This community has been a source of inspiration for us which is why we have created a solution to help and integrate carpenters with designers, makers, and fathers. And our proposal is to have a, a very, very worldwide hybrid to integrate carpenters in our Fab Lab network. And this project will benefit local artisans and local carpenters. And I think this is one of our solution to integrate more communities in our new industrial uh, production. And actually this model it's, uh, is, is actually working in Peru and I am living in other country and actually I am creating a, a first uh, experiment like this one. This is uh, the Lamas Cousin, the Lamas Cousin calls alpaca. So we are trying to promote our culture and our knowledge from Peru for others, other, other countries. So we can do it with an ecosystem carpenters to integrate people, artisans, and designers together. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you, Vanessa. So the final presentations, Benno, take us into the last four. Thank you, Joel. Thank you, friends. Well, changing systems together uh, promotes collective actions. These people uh, are sharing programs and different projects to bring uh, or, or to share responsibility to bring about mainful and impactful transformation in different systems. It implies that change is not a solitary endeavor, but requires, requires the effort of multiple individuals, groups, and working in, in union. So our first system changer is the Mega Woman Super Megan, <laughs> Megan Smith from Chief 7, uh, who is share with us about tech and learning bias. Welcome. Mary. Hi, everybody. Yeah, just um, this, this is an image just to show a positive side of the tech, how we can go, where we can go for tech learning. You've already heard amazing genius people who are doing the same idea. I was uh, had the chance to work for President Obama as the United States Chief Technology Officer. And so you might take that job as I'm doing technology, but really it was about empowerment, empowerment using technology, science, these topics for any topic. And so this is an example of a community organizing of innovation that we did. So across the world, there's these tech meetups. You know, you, many of you have been to some of these. If you haven't, there's one near you, you'll be surprised, look them up. And these people are meeting and they're cross-sharing what they're doing. So we invited 50 people and you see all these cities, Albuquerque, Anchorage, all people from the cities who are organizing. You know, we have a state, Idaho. Boise, Idaho has 15 tech meetups. And one of them, it has 800 people in it. And I'm telling you, nobody else but them in Boise knows about it. So how can we get more people in and how can we make sure that the topic on the stage or that we're presenting is going to be of interest to the other people who are going to join like the example of the non-makers, they're really makers in a different sector, maybe their history or uh, policy or other things. The second thing we did was very similar to what we're doing here. We invited 50 people who already had really cool programs that brought people in. I'll just say one rec tech, an old rec center, basketball, this kind of stuff. 
that they made a tech center, a fab lab, little kids, big kids, mega was high school, nano was little kids, high school teach little kids, et cetera. So this is just getting each other in the same method, two slides, two minutes, and then sit down together and realize, and wow. We're and by the way, we're time. I can do that. So uh, I'll let you go, but the next one I already mentioned in the next slide is just about the United Nations Solution Summit. Joel, if you advance it. Yeah. Uh, that's just the same thing. And uh, just in the corner there is Gaza. You know, we hear such sad and tough things from Gaza right now, but this is our innovators in Gaza working together. So anywhere we go, and on the left, it's a place uh, initiative. So I'll hand off to the next teammate, but just community organize ourselves in these ways and we can really move faster. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. Amazing. So our second system changer, it's Master Blair from Detroit, who is sharing with us about community self-sufficient. Welcome, Super Blair. Thank you. Well, Blair, we're not hearing you. audio that. It's not good. We're hearing just a little bit. We can hear some sound, but not really you. Do you want to sign off and sign on? We'll go to the next one and come back to you. Yeah, let's try that. Um, and otherwise, uh, I can share a little bit, but I can't substitute for Blair. Um, so, uh, Sherry, why don't you do uh, Fab City? Okay, so Benno and I are going to talk about this together, but Fab City, uh, if you think about the UN Sustainable Development Goals, it's about solving the world's greatest challenges, right? And this is at a global scale and at a national scale. They really are trying to make systems change. Fab City is a project that's trying to make systems change using digital fabrication to create sustainable uh, product, pro, producing and consuming in sustainable ways. So it's looking at the city scale, the regional scale, and the community scale. And it's really about can we import data and export data, but all of our supplies, materials, the supply chain, the manufacturing, the distribution, and the um, and the recycling all happens in the city, in the community, et cetera. And so uh, that's really what it's about. And it's about a framework. We've got about 41 cities uh, uh, and kingdoms and islands and communities signed up around this framework for how do we build a sustainable world and how do we solve these challenges together through digital fabrication. Recently, uh, in the last few years, we've been to do very interesting concrete solutions with community. And I want to turn this over to Benno to talk a little bit about that. Thank you, Cherry. Yes, maybe you could ask to yourself, wow, that is great, but I am not a mayor. How could I participate of the network? Please, next slide. So there are many possibilities if you want to join the Fab City program. These are one of the most famous uh, challenge. No, the, the last year it was in Bali, and this year we have in Bhutan uh, this uh, Fab City challenge with five amazing topics that will integrate local communities with the global communities in order to address this uh, global chief uh, in, in relative to cities. But uh, yeah, well, by the moment this is closed. But if you want to uh, participate in another. Uh, activities, I encourage to you to go to Fab City webpage and see all the programs and all the opportunities that you have. For example, the bioregional uh, approach tomorrow for people in Latin America, there is um, uh, a talk about that. Uh, if you want more details, I will share with you in the in the chat, no, the, 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 the register link. Thank you so much. Great. And we are at time. Um, do we have a link now for Blair? Can you hear me now at all? Much better. Okay. Yay. So, okay, so very quickly. Uh, so Insight Focus is really focused around using digital fabrication in fab labs as a strong anchor for community-based production. It mixes in agroecology and some other things also. And so we have discovered over time that we really need to make an impact on the conditions around our production center to allow full participation in it. So we recently relocated from Detroit to a historic black community in a more rural part of Michigan. And the community was initially started as a resort community during times of legal and kind of practical segregation. It's called Idlewild, Michigan. 
the community has a really good natural resource base and it has a history of kind of making a way out of no way, um, given its kind of origin story. And so, you know, we're really, really, we are really focused on deepening the implementation of community production and doing that within the context of the carrying capacity of the area that we're in. We can't deal with global planetary boundaries here, but we can deal with the carrying capacity of the land that we are that we are stewarding and be trying to be in a right relationship with. And so our specific kind of inclusion divisions here that are producing challenges are around racial. You know, we had a community in a township that has radically different um, racial mixtures that are kind of segregated within their pockets. Um, cultural, especially in this political environment. Um, generational, seasonal versus year round, born here versus transplants. Um, fortunately, we don't have a significant gender balance. Actually, most of our community and government leadership is women. Um, and the participation kind of goes from top to bottom. But all of these divisions really get activated when we begin trying to use community production within a solidarity economy kind of framework, because you're driving change and people have their vested interest in mind with the changes. And so if you could kind of flip to the next slide for a second, you know, in the process of, of and maybe we're close to time, Blair. OK, so we're focused on kind of government change in addition to community level change, in addition to changes in our workplace environment. And we started deeply collaborating with the solidarity economy folks across the United States to bring in expertise in community land trusts and worker co-ops to base our work within the Fab Lab and the Fab Lab work in the community around distributive economic mechanisms that have de democratic models. And we've been able to have a significant impact on our local government to develop more transparency and more community participation. So the environment that we're operating within seems fair enough for people to be able to feel that they're heard and can participate in kind of future looking possibilities around changing from working and buying stuff to innovating and making stuff. Super. And that's Thank actually- so just, great. just let me introduce Liz Super Joel. Yes, and to close this group of changing system, we have an amazing changer of systems, of course, Super Joel, who is going to talk about large scale system change. Welcome, Super Joel. Thank you. Um, so, the picture you see in the upper right hand corner uh, is a picture that I took of Dominique in 2004. Today, I'm told she's in graduate school studying engineering. Uh, this was in the very first or second Fab Lab, depending on how you count it, in the south end of Boston. And that's an example of coming from the community from the ground up. Just as Blair was saying in his presentation, there's important things happening from the ground up, from the neighborhood. But if you go down to the picture below, this is the Fab Lab in Champaign-Urbana, which I helped to start when I was at the University of Illinois. And there was also a top-down quality in that we had to get space allocated. We had to get support from various folks um, to launch and um, build out the lab. What I will tell you is that the technology took less than six months to install and get up and running while the social system, the committees, the groups took about three years to really come together. Uh, so the ground up social is harder than the technical. And that gets to my last point, which is work that I've done in the article that you see on the far left, which is not just top down and bottom up, but we'll call middle across, reaching out to boys clubs, girls clubs, reaching out to ministers, to community churches and others, to do horizontal or lateral alignment of the Fab Lab in the community. And the article that you see in the middle is an article that I wrote with Neil and our brother, Alan, that all of this can come together, top down, bottom up and middle across to represent a different model of self-sufficient production in our communities. So that's a very quick vision of large scale systems change and we're really at time to say, how does this all add up into a solution palooza? By the way, about a third of the presentations you heard today were folks that showed up for the first Fab All In and that were then nominated for this presentation. But let me hand it back to Megan. Yeah, so just to wrap up, thank you everybody who presented and your genius work. Um, everybody listening, two things might be happening for you. One, 
you might be like, oh my God, I learned, I wanna, I've been trying to figure out, I wanna learn more about that or these 10 things or all of them or whatever it is. The second thing is that you may have something already that you're doing, probably many of you do. And so you can bring that insight, that innovation, that capability to this network. You know, we haven't had an internet uh, as humanity at the level that we have now. And so the use of it can be for many things, but certainly one of them is for solving and, and those who've solved already sharing faster uh, across and iterating together. So we, I think we'll leave you with this, um, the idea of solutions palooza, you know, solutions jam is when we're working on trying to figure stuff out. That if we can bring different kinds of people together, we'll be more effective. And a palooza is when we show off. So our, our curriculum really has a sharing component of what's already there and an introspection component for you where you're looking at roses, buds, thorns, meaning things that are going great, things that are really not going great and things that are emergent, a, a bud that you could tack into and reflecting and thinking through what you wanna do and running through an interactive program uh, uh, with all these colleagues to learn more about what they're doing and spend some time with you and your teams and your community to reflect on what how you might take some of this genius into the local spaces um, in whatever dimension you want or how you might also join us as faculty um, with the things that you have already had there. So, so thank you make so it much. Crew, yeah. if, if I could, let yeah. me ask a question, which is the recitation became a working group. The working group became then a trial program through Academeni. Uh, look ahead to the future plan. Are you gonna do another cycle? Talk about the schedule. Yeah, Jill, I don't know anybody, we, we, we together think we'll do another cycle of the program in the fall, the same, same kind of curriculum, and we're going to add, we learned people wanted to go deeper. So in addition to the five sessions that cover really what you just heard, but a little deeper, and conversations and iteration by those coming through the workshop, we're going to add some office hour recitation so we can go even deeper in those, um, which will be great. And the key is that a lot of people are faced with these challenges, you know, in these days of artificial intelligence and all this stuff coming out and human intelligence is here for us and teamwork is here for us. And so taking the time to prioritize this is really worth it because we will have the kind of collective genius and inclusion that the world humanity deserves and can be. We have too many problems in the world. And so the only way to solve them is much more surface area of doers and makers who are passionate so this point of this program really centers on the passion that somebody in your community has and how you can make an effort there's joy for them and make it really a, a celebration of capability and learning. Um, Woody Flowers, who's one of our heroes who passed away, he always says there's a, the gift behind the gift. If you get a tool, the real gift is what you can learn to do with the tool. Um, let me suggest. Just a homework assignment for the Bhutan event, which is to make a schedule for the fall for people who want to participate. Sounds good. We will do it and we always crowdsource it amongst ourselves. So it's not too Absolutely. much work for any one person. And um, I appreciate the one more thing about Blair's thing. So, so Joel, one thing, Blair, it was so interesting. You were talking about how in the policy and the mayors and the community orgs, there were so many women. And we find in one of the technical things, so many men, but if we did innovation technology on policy and like you're doing, we'll get much more balance because we've restricted what the tools are for. So I call it play the whole orchestra with all the people on all the hardest problems and find the most talented orchestra players to teach everyone else. Agreed. Great, with that, thank you all. I'll stop the recording. And I assume you're gonna keep meeting at the pace you've been running. Yeah, so we will have, uh, at Bhutan, we'll be able to announce the actual schedule of the sessions, but it will be, in a sense, and as Megan says, a, an expanded version of what you saw here. Great, thank you all. <laughs>